You ready? I'm ready. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics. For this week's session with Dave Kranzler, silver market expert, chapter one of the big silver short. By the way, we thought we were recording the episode. We're just sitting there like making silver jokes for the last five minutes. Uh, didn't realize I had not Press the appropriate button, but anyway, hopefully now you can see and hear us. Uh, special Friday episode, I would say really targeted at whether you are a member of the Reddit Wall Street Bets group, or I know a lot of the people in our audience are probably going in there and in the chat room. So Dave, it's really great to have you here and you know, again, you have Wall Street trading experience. You know, it's not not coming out of left field. You've seen how some of these things work. A very credible opinion um, on a very Dated interesting- junk bonds institutionally for nine years. Mark yeah. So you have that background. For anyone who's new uh, to my career, uh, I traded equity options for Susquehanna, which was- You made markets also. Yeah, and then in 2009, I started learning about gold and silver. 2011, started realizing something was not quite, <laughs> despite the CFTC saying they couldn't find squat. Well, they actually found, Bart Chilton found plenty. They didn't tell us. Um, anyway, so a lot of stuff going on, and welcome on in, and it's going to be fun to dig into this situation. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Happy Friday. Well, thank you, Dave. It's a pleasure to have you here. And real quick, before we get started, I do have one announcement. Pleased to announce my friend John Lee of Silver Elephant Mining, uh, their company, Silver Elephant, named to the 2021 OTCQX Best 50. And uh, I'll read a quote here from John State, Silver Elephant's pursuit of mass silver, nickel, and vanadium metal resources in the ground has great appeal to investors looking to preserve their wealth and profit from energy metals in the future. Um, so certainly uh, with a lot of attention drawing on silver, the commodity, good time to be aware of silver elephant uh, mining stock. And there's can, a- Can I ask a question? <laughs> Please, Dave, go ahead. I, yeah. I thought elephants were gray, not silver. This one is he's looking for some silver. He's, he's digging his trunk around. He thinks he found some. Okay. So, so he, I get it. So he's saying, hey, I got an elephant sized silver deposit somewhere, somewhere under the ground here. Where's his project in Peru or something? It's in Bolivia, Dave. Or Bolivia, yeah. Yeah. I knew it was in that part of the world. There might be. Well, a, if he's got a big a silver deposit. Elephant sized why? deposit. So if you well, want. Why not call can... it silver mammoth? What if it's a mammoth sized deposit or silver brontosaurus? If I was him, you know, that's what I would have called it. It's not just an elephant sized deposit, it's a brontosaurus sized deposit. I'd say whether it's an elephant or a brontosaurus sized deposit, maybe you <laughs> want to go to the website, learn more about the company so you can. I look at it. So I like the idea. Um, I don't so, own it, but I, I like the idea. I'd like, I'd like to see it go down in price and then I'd own it. Well, it's going to be interesting <laughs> to see what happens to the prices of a lot of things. Obviously, I know people have seen the prices of uh, GameStop, AMC, historic events. So Dave, before we get back to silver, any, any comments in general on what we saw with those short squeezes and... Uh, then we can tie into how that might play out in Silverland. Sure. Um, I mean, these stocks, the, the non-mining stocks that are getting the Dickens squeezed out of them, most of them, or a lot of them had short interest that was in excess of 100% of the float, which means that whoever was shorting it, whether it's a hedge fund, maybe a Wall Street trading desk, maybe a sophisticated uh high net worth investor, I don't know, um, probably was naked shorting some of it. My guess would probably be uh, there were hedge funds that were um, naked shorting it. I mean, GameStop, <laughs> the company itself is just a shitty little company, right? And it got juiced because the, the founder of, of Chewy, which also loses a lot of money every quarter, it generates massive operating cash, operating losses, 
So, you know, the founder of Chewy decided he was going to take a stake in Game, Game Stock or GameStop and, and uh, shut down their brick and mortar stores and, and move it into the completely digital world. Well, the problem is it doesn't matter if it's, if it's digital or, or brick and mortar, that company can't make money. And so there was a reason why it was trading where it was trading before the market got a hold of it and squeezed it inside out. So, and eventually it's going to head back from whence it came at some point. I mean, who knows how long this short squeeze will persist, but um, I mean, that that's why hedge funds were, you know, short as hell this stock because, you know, it was headed toward bankruptcy and it probably will be anyway, eventually. So, I mean, it's, you know, I, these, these short squeezes that, that are being generated by, by, you know, primarily retail, I'm sure there's plenty of hedge funds that are jumping in on the action. You know, not every hedge fund is a short selling hedge fund. Um, and some of them are actually traditional real hedge funds where they're long and short, right? So um, this game probably isn't going to last a long time. I don't know if the regulators are going to step in and shut it down. Certainly, um, Elizabeth Warren is jumping up and down as, as she hey, wants come, to come do. Come on, Gary, Gary Gensler's on it now. Of course, it's yeah, continued. Gary Gensler, sure. What I will say, though, um, there was a nice article from Wall Street on Parade out this morning. And uh, believe it or not, I mean, one of the objects of attack by the, you know, the, the Wall Street bets group are, are the big banks. Well, JP Morgan was long out the ass game stock. stock. So they, you know, if they sold it when it was over 400, they, they made, you know, nine figures on their position. So it's not like you're... You know, the thing of it is, is, is these Wall Street banks and at the at the at the um, longer standing hedge funds, these guys are sophisticated traders. They've been at this game for, you know, as long as I have or longer. They know how to play this game. And they're, they're not there may be some hedge funds that are being hurt like that, Melvin. But so what? <laughs> Citadel, my old boss, who's the head of my trading desk, worked at Citadel for a while. I guarantee you Citadel is going to make a fortune on that acquisition of, of Melvin. So, you know, you think you're attacking Ken Griffin. He's out there. He's laughing. He's laughing all the way to the bank. So is Jamie Dimon apparently on this, you know? So, Dave. I mean, I, I applaud the effort at going after the man, believe me, you know, I'm as anti-establishmentarianism as, as anyone, you know, I mean, Abby Hoffman was my idol when I was in high school in the late seventies. Right. Most of the people watching this probably don't even know who Abby Hoffman was. So I hate Wall Street. I hate, you know, I hate all the financial corruption. But what's going on out here is not going to bring hedge funds and Wall Street to its knees, believe me. Well, Dave, I, I, don't, I don't even know where to begin. I'm, I'm appalled that you would suggest that J.P. Morgan could in some way be involved in some sort of inappropriate behavior. I mean, what are the chances <laughs> of that? Uh, Listen, I hate J.P. Morgan and Jamie Dimon as much as I hate anyone. <laughs> yeah, well, I had a feeling you might say, well, the, the first part, it looks like first Majestic down 36 cents after the close, but I guess, hey, here's the thing, is that I don't know who's in the Wall Street bets forum, uh, I'm gonna start going through it though. I'm excited to do that. I think people have been posting stuff uh, on our behalf in there, but I mean, you never know who is in there. I mean, and perhaps more significantly, I guess the the what I would say to silver investors, first majestic investors, just the fact that this is like front of CNBC. Okay, maybe they're not covering the silver part yet, but look at these. Uh, uh, here's the headlines on get this. Okay. I see. Thank you. I got that alert. <laughs> nope. It's not going to go away, but, um, silver rallies after Reddit post about executing a short squeeze. So let's take a look here on, uh, I mean that it's at least in the conversation now, whereas I don't know, despite, you know, I think we have fun, like talking and making jokes about JP Morgan every week, but, I think the majority of the world has no idea about this so that so anything that sheds light on it to me is a net positive 
because okay maybe there's not let's say for a second there's not enough buying power in there now well maybe by the time the word keeps spreading and now it's a national media event i just see it can only be a good thing and uh let's see if we have any uh okay so there first majestic on cnbc and we'll come back to this robin hood guy but any any thoughts on that dave in terms of just that the fact that this has been a crime that you know they tried to keep hidden and you know everyone's like whenever you people like you or i or the others that speak up i mean there's there's a handful of them out there you know but Anytime we point out evidence, they tell us we're conspiracy theorists and all that stuff. But I mean, it's actually pretty simple. And I think the more that it gets out, now you create that environment where, I don't know, maybe there's some hedge funds that don't give a darn about silver as money, but they're like, oh, this is an interesting situation. Wait, and it, this, the, I'm like, Comex shows them being short. How, how many contracts? Or actually, uh, give me a se second, I'll pull up. I was curious to see what the volume of the futures was yesterday while we were seeing a roller coaster in the markets. So there's, what if all those people were reading Wall Street Journal and CNBC, you know, maybe if a handful of them, a couple hundred people watching here now, if they see this darn thing loads, but basically you had 200,000 uh, contracts trade yesterday not 200,000. Uh, basically, you had over a, a billion ounces of silver trade yesterday. It's, it's paper silver. Some right, but silver. that... I'm just saying that there's a tension on things like these. Maybe some hedge fund managers notice there's... So 205,000 contracts. That's over a billion ounces. And I might you, add... You had almost the same amount on January 8th or 6th or whatever that was before I any of this stuff started. I noticed. Oh. So here's a little trick. January 8th, I did this last night. Whenever there is heavy volume, let's take a look at what happened to the price on January 8th. Uh, let's go to the historical silver chart. But Dave, I guess the bigger point being that people are noticing what's going on. All right, let me put it in different terms. There's one on my question list. What do you think Eric Sprott is doing right now? What's he talking to his friends about right now? I, I don't know. Maybe like, you know, wherever they're going to take his Learjet for the weekend. I, you know, they, they can fly without wearing masks because it's a private jet. <laughs> so maybe, maybe I, they're I don't gonna know. Go to the I, I'll tell you what. He's not, there's out, your, there there's your January on, he's not out there loading up on paper silver. You know, he, he's probably, you know, have his, his guys, his team is probably, you know, still scouring for junior mining stocks with highly prospective silver projects to invest in. Maybe he's buying more physical silver. I don't know. I don't think Eric Sprott dicks around in the paper silver market. <clears throat> okay. That's great. That wasn't really my question, but we well, asked me what I okay, think he's doing I'll, right I'll, now. I won't leave I a question. What he's doing right now. If he's I can doing just... what he normally does. Okay. Then I will, I'll share my opinion if I may for a moment. Sure. I wonder if there's any chance that at some point this weekend, Eric Sprott talks to any of his friends who aren't probably high school kids, but uh, have investable funds and think, gee, maybe there's a vulnerable situation. And I, and I don't want to speak for Eric, obviously, I, but I mean, I just think that thought is running through a lot of people's minds, which to me is makes the situation interesting i mean i, I see you're not impressed okay but I, I mean you know honestly i'm not i'm not sure that these silver mining stocks make great short squeeze candidates that's not what i'm talking about though what, what about psl about? a lot of these guys in the reddit group they're talking about pslv and we'll get to the mechanics of what might be the best way to do something like that but you have now a, a spectacle that is bringing attention to silver. And in the meantime, 
I think this happened after last week's show, and I, I don't think I can wait any longer to share this one. Despite the Fed's balance sheet now being almost seven and a half trillion dollars, they're moving Janet into the White House allegedly, um, and she's saying to, it's time yeah. to go big. I mean. <laughs> What I'm going to call, maybe we, if Andy Sheckman's listening, call in and we can just put this on the front of the Miles Franklin homepage. You couldn't <laughs> b- make a better marketing campaign. I'll get a picture of the balance sheet. I'll put her there. And then now we have uh, Reddit groups that I'm, I'm told is picking up steam and there's like more people joining by the second. But I see you're not phased. You're like, eh, okay. <laughs> All right. I got, a, don't worry. I got a backup plan. <laughs> All right. I, let, me, let me try the curveball. Let's see if. You know, is. that just that nasty picture of Janet Yellen just leaves me speechless. I mean, every aspect of that woman horrifies me intellectually and, and physically. <laughs> Okay, well, how about she should be uh, like, you know, somewhere in, in, you know, living in like San Diego, knitting sweaters for her grandchildren or something. Well, how about, you know, we'll look at the antidote for central bankers, which would be GATA, our good friends, uh, Silver Bill Murphy and Chris Powell. Chris Powell has been on fire this week. He's the one who writes these headlines. Um, by the way, Chris and Bill, if you are listening, your first majestic silver cubes came in. Yara has her cube. cube. You didn't win a cube, cube buddy. Uh uh-uh. uh. You got it. Yeah, well, start I have this. this. Start, an- have start this. answering some that. of the questions, buddy, and then maybe you get yourself a cube. Look at that. I've got this. That's, that's like a, a little. It's a one ounce bar. silver bar minted by Degusa. With, you know, and that's that's a tennis player. That's me right there. That's what I got. The silver tennis Dave Owens. I don't need no stinking first majestic silver cube, although I do want one. They're really beautiful. I love when you start pouting. It's one of my favorite <laughs> parts of the show. Dave, <laughs> all right. Well, maybe you can start building your resume for a silver cube at, at Silverfest 2, which is right around the corner in September. Here, JP Morgan helpfully lists 45 other shares vulnerable to the short busters. Wow, that certainly is kind of them. I wonder if they mentioned JP Morgan. I tried to find the list. We'll click on their link. I don't know if this has been updated. I guarantee you, before they put that out, the first thing they did is they went out and their tra- their prop desk loaded up on call options on every single one of those stocks. Dave. Come on now. This is a family show. I got to <laughs> I got to issue the warning here. You know, I've, the legal legal stuff too. So obviously, you know, we can't just go on the air and talk about a bank being a bunch of felons. Well, actually, yeah, I, you know, actually you can Well, I mean it's exactly a true that assertion, right? Because there's already 74,600 search results when you Google J.P. Morgan felonies. Um, two more felony counts for price manipulation. Uh, right. See, you can call him a felon. It's, 920 it's, it's, that's, that's for misdeeds. And I think I'm seeing one of my lawyer friends this weekend who I've got excited about the premise of Figuring out how Daniel Shack and his hedge fund already got a settlement from JP Morgan. And so I'm going to find out somehow what he said that made them write the check. And then I'm going to invite a couple thousand of my silver friends to uh, <laughs> come to the party. Dave, you can join in on that too. But um, not surprising to see JP Morgan involved in this one. But Dave, I'm going to get to some of the questions I have here. I guess, first of all, did you happen to catch the, the guy from Robin Hood? And for folks who may not have heard all of what happened, uh, Robin Hood and several other brokerages put restrictions, basically saying you couldn't buy. Sounds kind of like the Hunt Brothers almost. 
I, I you'd probably know a lot better than me. I hear there's, you know, if it's remove the buyers kind of would help the shorts. And then he came on the air and there was some video with him on CNBC. I didn't understand anything he was saying, to be completely honest. Any thoughts on uh, what Robin Hood and the brokerages did? You mean when they restricted the trading? Yeah, that was, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I don't watch CNBC, so um, <laughs> I will say the guy who started Robin Hood probably could use a haircut, though. Um, but, uh I mean, honestly, uh, brokerage firms have a right to protect their, their, the integrity of their business. I'm not saying Robinhood is a business of high integrity, but um, you, when, they, when they extend margin to their customers, and that's a service that the brokerage firm is providing, they don't have to extend margin if they don't want to. They have to borrow the money themselves and they need credit lines in order to be able to extend margin to their customers, right? So it's quite possible that they either ran out of capital that they needed to fund margin accounts so that people could use margin accounts, or they were probably worried because of the high volatility that you know they, they may be over their skis in terms of the amount of margin they've extended to a, a large body of their customers because most they're all retail guys right and, you know and so even if you're talking about odd lot positions you add that up over thousands of customers and th that's a pretty big margin tab and it's, it's one of those things where you know if if you owe the bank a hundred dollars and you can't pay you're screwed you owe the bank a hundred million dollars and can't pay the bank screwed right and so my guess is, this is what I said before the news even came out yesterday that they, that they had tapped into or, or got extended credit lines, bigger credit lines, and they got a billion dollar cash injection from, from the people who have originally invested in Robinhood. So my guess is they were worried about either blowing themselves up because their customers would default. And GameStop yesterday, keep point, yeah, GameStop, I want to call it GameStop, but uh. That thing dropped from like, you know, 485, I think is where it peaked. It was trading under 200 at one point. I mean, that can blow up a brokerage firm if, if the customers can't meet their margin calls. Now, you know, fortunately, and who knows, you know, Robinhood might have even been itself may have been part of the, um, you know, part of the push to push the stock higher to protect their franchise. Um, but, you know, th that was look at that in the same light as what happened to the Hunt brothers. That's not why the Hunt brothers were, were for, you know, that's not why the Hunt brothers were shut down. And for a while, the COMEX was only letting people sell silver contracts, not buy them. I honestly think Robin Hood probably was in danger of blowing up if, if, their, if enough of their customers had margin calls that they couldn't meet, because then all of a sudden Robin Hood owes that money to the banks that they borrowed the money from. So I don't, again, you know, I think Robin Hood is, is, a, is a detestable, is a detestable business, but I don't think that that was, I don't think it was done to, to um, stop people from buying Game, GameStop. I think it was, or, you know, any of these stocks, I think it was done so that they could protect their flank. And I, you know, it turns out I was probably right because they had to raise a billion dollars, right? After the market closed. Yeah, and uh, Dave, I guess this was, excuse me, one second. <laughs> Having a uh, contact lens issue, but we'll, we'll continue on here. Look um, around it, man. This is, I'm gonna go one time. One lensed for a little bit here. But you have here, um, when, I, when I heard Elizabeth Warren come out, Again, this is just what I'm wondering. Given everything we've seen in the last month, do you think it's possible that somewhere involved with these short squeezes is one political party trying to stick it to the other in some fashion? Again, I'm completely speculating, but just as an option trader who wonders about possibilities and we've seen a lot of unusual stuff. As soon as I saw... <laughs> 
here's Elizabeth Warren. I, I wonder who, maybe she's counting on Gary Gensler to do something, but do you think, I mean, we hear Soros's name pop up a lot of the time when money shows up for unusual things. Uh, what do you think there, Dave? Uh, I think it's a shame that Elizabeth, and I, I find Elizabeth Warren as detestable as any of them. Um, but I, I think it's a shame that, you, you know, it's gotten to the point where you Should have I leave that up for you. Oh, God, please. Where you have, you know, congressmen who are calling out the SEC over something like this. I mean, again, don't get me wrong. I'm all for attacking the man. But these short squeezes in the market, ultimately, a lot of people are going to get hurt. I mean, this is not really any different than what was going on. I mean, the motive might be a little bit different. And again, I think the motive is superficial, but um, this is exactly what it looked like at the end of the dot-com bubble in, in late 1999 and early 2000. I mean, you had stocks going up uh, uh, even more than, than GameStop has gone up or more than AMC went up and is now falling back to earth. But um, to me, this is, this is, uh, this is almost identical to what it looked like when the doc, right before the dot com bubble blew up. And um, I saw a study that was, that was, came out a couple of years after that, after that whole thing happened, after the NASDAQ had crashed 85%, I think, from top to bottom. Um, and 95% of the retail day traders who were, in, who were, you know, all of a sudden trading experts for about a year. Um, lost, they, they got completely wiped out. So very, very small percentage of retail traders actually ended up not losing money or making money. And I'm, what I'm fearful of is that you're going to see the same thing happen here. So um, honestly, I'm, I'm kind of surprised the SEC, the SEC is, is supposed to be the watchdog that protects the public, right? It, it's, it's a public servant. It doesn't operate that way anymore. It's more like it serves to well, protect the banking really bank did. interests. What? I mean, maybe it never really did, but no, I don't know. I think a, that there was a time when the SEC actually performed the, the role that it was supposed to perform. And that, you know, that was probably the case up until I don't know, the mid mid nineteen eighties forward, and it got worse under Clinton and it, it just gets worse every under every president. So it's, it's the regulatory capture of the big banks. They've, you know, they've got basically the people sitting in the, in the positions that these regulatory agencies, the Justice Department, SEC, the CFTC, they're hand puppets for, for you know, Wall Street billionaire titans. That's what they are. So, I mean, <laughs> to me, again, it's, it's shocking that Gensler has been silent. You know, silence of the lambs. <laughs> He's been dead silent on this, and it takes a, a criminal like Elizabeth Warren who remember when she claimed to be Native American and she did a DNA test and she had like almost zero Native American DNA in her. <laughs> so um, uh, I, I just, I think it's, I think it's criminal in and of itself that it takes a Congressman to, to call out the SEC before, and we don't know if the SEC is even going to do anything. Who knows? Well, I mean, I at least that's one of the things I try to get across on the show where. Well, but what I will say at the end of the day, and I'm predicting this, call me out if I'm ultimately wrong. I think there's going to be a lot of retail traders, these newly minted experts who took their stimulus check in March and gave it to, to Robin Hood. Um, I think there's going to be a, a lot of those um, who end up losing all their money and they're going to be hurt by this. And it's not like Robin Hood is, you know, Robin Hood is basically, they sell all of their order flow to, to Citadel. So <laughs> when you trade on Robin Hood, you're actually, you know, a pawn for Citadel. Citadel is making a lot more money off of this than these traders are. <clears throat> well, that's usually, uh, usually baked in there somewhere where nobody's looking. Um, right. Although Dave, in terms of, Again, not legal financial advice, but just an old timer like yourself. You know, if any of the kids are watching, be like, all right, let, maybe someone made a 
couple billion dollars or million dollars on Bitcoin or GameStop, where I hear the market cap is about 27 billion, which probably could many times over buy the available silver supply. So in terms of available options, obviously, if someone tried to take delivery on the COMEX, and I know you've done that before, so you can comment on that if you if you'd like, and if I'm remembering that correctly, I find it interesting that B, these guys have been targeting the options market, which certainly I would do if I, you know, knew the price was going to, so yeah, I fortunately did last week and this time it worked out okay. Um, well, though, see, I hear a lot of people talking about SLV and obviously I know uh, we, we've talked before about the, do, do they have the metal or not? Who knows yet? It made me think, what if, uh, what is it 50,000 or 500,000? Like you, there is like supposedly a redemption feature of SLV. Do you remember how many units that is? I know it's like really big. So it's like beyond most average retail investor, but like, what if someone, I won't put, I don't want to even put a name and because it's again, I'm speculating, but let's say there's a couple billionaires on the reading those messages right now and they wanted to someone wanted to buy a billion dollars worth of slv shares and then try to execute that redemption feature what what would that play out like it's all it's already played out with gld no SLV. that's that that's happened with gld where wealthy wealthy entity or individual has tried to go and 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 it's a, it's a redemption basket. See, I forget what, I don't know what it is with SLV. I, I've read the GLD perspectives front to back and back to front. Um, and I think it's, again, it's been, a, I, I wrote a paper about it in 2009, but I think it's 10,000 shares of GLD is what you need to, to redeem for gold. <clears throat> People have tried it and they've been told to go pound sand. The only, the only entities that are allowed to um, uh, redeem shares for, for bullion are the bullion banks themselves. The, I think they're called approved participants or something like that. So, and um, again, I, I know of this for a fact because I was having a conversation with someone and this was several years ago, off the record, someone who's well-known, most of the people in this who are in the audience probably would know who it is. Um, but he insisted in anonymity who said that he knows specifically of a certain couple people who tried to redeem shares from GLD and they were denied. So make of that what you will, but I have never thought that either of these trusts have all of the gold or silver that they're supposed to have in them. And we already know that GLD leases a fair amount of its parts from the Bank of England as a subcustodian. So those bars never leave the Bank of England. I mean, technically, GLD doesn't even own, they don't own those bars. They're just borrowing them. So um, I don't think you're going to squeeze SLV because if, if, a, if a lot of cash flows into SLV looking to buy the shares and just buying the options in SLV, that's not going to do anything. That's not going to create a gamma squeeze because they'll just print more shares. But, you know, that, that, that's the same thing with COMEX contracts. You're not going to squeeze the shorts. And, and Although, Dave, to, to be specific, I'm not saying just buying SLV shares, but what if someone took a billion dollars, bought the yeah, shares? Yeah, and what I'm saying is they're going to be denied. They're going to be denied. It's already happened with GLD. I know for a fact it's happened with GLD. Well, this is perfect, though, because if uh, somebody did that, then we could call, uh, in fact, <laughs> some billionaire, if someone with a billion dollars goes in Buys so SLV. Do, call Gary first. Gensler at the SEC and wine. No, <laughs> I'll laugh at you. If somebody actually does that and gets denied, email me and I'll call Elizabeth Warren and invite her on the show and I'll we'll explain it to her. She won't care either. She's essentially a captive of the banks, believe well, it or not. She's I know. just grandstanding right now. Although here's the thing is that, yeah, of course that's true, but I always leave open the possibility that like, for example, I'm not a big fan of Nancy Pelosi, but what if somehow like I presented, hey, if you uh, here's the silver thing, the Republicans let it go on 
their watch and look at the security. It's like somehow if you pit these these bozos against each other, they're all, all right. they're all the same flavor. They're all they're all like go look at who their biggest donors are. Ye of little faith. Well, I've um, been doing this for 20 years and I've, 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 I've seen pretty much everything and every attempt at trying to break the, the bank cartel. You sound there's like the guy in, who in said the they couldn't metals. run a four minute mile. There, there's only, there's only, I did run a, a four thirty eight mile in high school. Um, well, the, the, there's only one way you're going to break this. And I don't, and again, I, I don't think you can do it because I'm with the hunts. That's all the hunts simply tried to do. They figured out there was more silver contract open interest than there was silver in the COMEX. So they were basically just doing a, a, a rich man's arbitrage, you know, they, a billionaire arbitrage. They were going and they were, they were going to just say, okay, let's see how much silver the COMEX really has. And we want to own silver. So they went and bought a bunch of contracts and tried and wanted to redeem them for silver. And they were shut down because the COMEX didn't have enough silver to fulfill the, the the delivery demand so all ponzi um, schemes end though i'm not saying I, I i to be clear i don't think anyone can sit here and say like all right yeah the silver guys are defeated but it's going to happen someday and i mean it's it's you're one of the people that uh, i'm not sure it's going to happen the on housing the bubble and it, it just you're you're one of the people that forecast the housing bubble collapsing in advance and I think it would be a similar sentiment. You know, there were probably times when you're watching that. I mean, we saw in the movie, The Big Short, how, yeah, you had to sit there and wait. You know, there's days where it's like, gee, is this ever going to happen? And again, to be clear, I don't have the information to say that it's Wall Street uh, bets is going to be able to take it down. But to say that because it's not happened. I mean, if you say that the theory that the metal is levered and that you know, silver isn't undervalued and $25 silver makes sense and I'm just completely missing it. Okay, fine. Maybe there's some probability of that. But if this thing is a Ponzi scheme and that, in my view, that it's a fractional reserve Ponzi scheme that has more people watching than ever, I don't give a darn if Nancy Pelosi or Donald Trump likes it. But if, if you know, I, I mean, you already have Elizabeth Warren commenting on it. And yeah, probably they're not going to go out of their way to talk about silver. But I'm just of the school of thought that when you keep throwing all these darts and the bubbles that big, that eventually something hits. And, you know, and that's fine. I see your, your old curmudgeonly old man like, well, it's fine. That's okay, though. That's cute, Chris. <laughs> you were all cranky at me because I didn't give you official warning that I was loading up the call options earlier this yeah, week. Yeah, that pissed so me off. I'm just you know, I got other things to do besides I'm, figure out what Wall Street Bets is going to do next. I'm just telling, I told you in advance. All you had to do was text me. I did that. I mean, I recorded a darn webinar about the whole thing. Like, I don't know <laughs> what else. In fact, Dave, you were even... <laughs> Got to gotta warn him. All right, Dave, I got to point out the, oh yeah, actually I should mention this. This is actually quite intriguing because as we're sitting here talking about a uh, short squeeze on silver, but I mean, it's already started playing out on First Majestic. And I don't know if you remember we dug into that. I don't know how long that's going to last. I mean, you know, the short interest was what, 28%, 25%? Yeah, yeah, just, just that's that's great. But I think First back, Majestic will go up on, on its own merits as the price of silver goes higher. Okay, and I think it's interesting that a week ago you and I and Chris Marchese and Rob Keynes did a call saying what's up with the short position on First Majestic. Uh, you and I talked about, I think it was Monday after we saw First Majestic trading a little weird. Any thoughts there? Um, and I mean, it could just be interesting timing, although it was spooky or surreal to see. And so someone, just, someone on uh, Wall Street Bets saw the saw the podcast and said, "Hey, let's gamma squeeze First Majestic." Because I think what what you saw yesterday and today with First Majestic was done primarily with call options, not not like <laughs> that might have been me. The short it's e it's it's easy to squeeze a stock that that has uh, you know. A short interest in that's in excess of the float but i mean here you're only talking about what 25 27 percent of the float 
you know, and again, I would argue that, I mean, who knows to what extent first, I mean, so price of silver is up four and a half percent today. It's up a buck 16. That's not Wall Street bets guys squeezing the COMEX. It's not the Wall Street bets guys going in there and loading up on, on silver contracts. I think that is a, a product of big investors saying, hey, look at what's going on here in, in, the, in the political and economic system. Look at all the money the Fed's printing. Silver is really Silver and gold are really cheap and silver is really cheap relative to gold. So, you know, to what extent, I don't know, you could run a regression analysis on it, maybe. To what extent was the increase in First Majestic yesterday and today a function of the price of silver going up? Or, and how much of it was a function of Wall Street bets guys and, and you, you didn't, you didn't give me a heads up because I would have done it too, buying out of the money calls, right? I mean, you bought at the time, First Majestic was trading where, 14, 15? And didn't you buy 18s? Bought a whole bunch of stuff, but it's. Yeah, so, but it was way out of the money. I mean, that, you know, and if enough people do that, we'll see it forces the like, market makers was... to buy the stock. And that's how you create a gamma squeeze. I, I don't think what you're seeing in, in First Majestic and, and uh, uh, Fortuna was also another one that was up a lot yesterday. I didn't really look at Fortuna today, but everything um, was soaring yesterday. I mean, it was right because then all of a sudden everyone's looking. Hey, what silver stocks? Even the one, even the five-letter OTC bulletin board silver junior stocks that I own a bunch of. They were up a lot yesterday, and they, they don't have options that trade. But I think people, they're in and of themselves their stock op their options, right? <laughs> I mean, I think you're proving my case for me that you saw the whole silver board soar yesterday. Yeah, because the price of silver was up also. All right. Well, I'm just and, saying. And based on that headline that you showed of that um, really nasty, gnarly looking lady, <laughs> uh, you know, she basically told that she's telegraphing, hey, the Fed's going to print a shitload of more money. The government's going to deficit spend a shitload more. That's that's the perfect recipe for gold and silver, you know. And again, silver is two to three times cheaper than gold right now, especially if you consider, um, you know, that the gold silver ratio is around 71, 72, and it's it's headed down to 30 and probably lower. So if I'm a fundamental investor, I'm going to look at this and say, I you know, I don't care what Wall Street bets is doing. I think silver is cheap as hell. So I'm going to go buy some. Well, that's why you're Dave, the silver expert, they call him, right? In fact, I got a... Well, I uh, this. Well, <laughs> I will, I will re-raise you, Dave, because I have this book here. Uh, come on, I'm going to turn my... Oh, let me get it there. The big silver short coming through the... Maybe I'll turn my background off a second because interesting, this book, Dave... There's chapter one about some guy from Denver who lays out. Some idiot. Lays out. So we got the big silver short. Chapter one, Dave Kranzler, gold and silver expert, newsletter writer, fund man, newsletter writer, fund manager. See, I have this thing I've been, I've tried a couple of times. Maybe we'll do today live on the air. It's actually interesting. If you just like pick a random page, and then it's funny how it often connects to what's happening. And it really, uh, so here on page 14, okay, perfect. And isn't JP Morgan the custodian of SLV? <laughs> isn't mean, it amazing the coincidences in this world? So, uh, also the, the largest silver short position on the COMEX. I mean, maybe Elizabeth Warren will, uh, Actually, I'm going to step back into my silver vault, my basement, I'll finish this one up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, although, Dave, we're going to we're going to wrap up. I'm exhausted. I mean, it's been a great week um, and a fun week, although a long week. So just a couple uh, last news items here and I'll give you the uh, final word. Uh, but here. Seems somehow inflation is uh, not as, is not the low inflation crisis does not appear to be spreading to Germany as much as it is in the central reserves or the federal reserves central banker office. 
Apparently in Germany, they're getting plenty of inflation. Bernie Sanders there in the red jacket? Um, I don't know. It's kind of hard to tell. He's wearing his his mask. Look, it's Bernie and Janet. (laughs) Well, the CO2 price, that's driving the inflation rate. The things these guys talk about that are driving the inflation rate and how they manage to avoid. Oh, who was it? Powell, the other day in the press conference, he actually said monetary policy had nothing to do with with the inflation or he said some whopper like that. He said that um, the, the the Fed's money printing and balance sheet had nothing to do with the, the rise in the stock market. So I immediately yeah. found a graph that showed the <laughs> pretty much 99.5% correlation between the spike up in the Fed's balance sheet and the spike up in the S&P 500 and tweeted it out. <laughs> yeah. I, uh... I can't believe, I, I honestly can't <clears throat> believe that that guy gets in front of the public and, and expects the people who are watching to believe the bullshit that comes out of his mouth. I honestly, I, if, if he really thinks that people are going to believe what he says, then, and I don't think he's dumb, but, or stupid or low IQ, it's not but real if he really believes that if he really thinks that people are going to buy that bullshit then he really is stupid. Well, let's keep all options open here. I mean, let's not be hasty. On the- <laughs> I don't want to sell that. I put am it, keeping my options open, you especially know what I mean? after hearing some of the nonsense that comes out of his mouth. What did you <laughs> think about when he said on 60 Minutes last year, said prior to COVID, the economy's never been stronger. Um, you, you didn't seem to explain the part about the swap lines that had started about six months prior to that and how he was pumping um, trillions <laughs> into the economy. Uh economy's never been stronger you know what it, what they're calling growth since 2008 since the last recession is the, the weakest the weakest level of gdp growth in the history of of the country so i don't know how he could say it's never been stronger i, I <laughs> and can actually if they use a real GD, gdp deflator a reasonable estimate of inflation instead of that bs that they call the cpi you're, you won't. You wouldn't even register nominal GDP growth. GD, GDP growth would decline. I did a paper on that with Paul Craig Roberts and John Williams several years ago. Will you come and read, read it to us one day? Pardon me. Will you read us the paper one day? <laughs> yeah, pour a, a cup of warm milk and read the paper by the fireside. <laughs> Could be lovely. I'd love to know what your your thoughts were on that one. Uh, in fact, it's on my blog somewhere. You just got to search for it. Well, I'll tell you what. Here's an interesting, uh, interesting piece of Dave Kranzler history that. No. <laughs> no. Came All right. Across uh, the other day. <laughs> Dave talking about the options expiration, which uh, that one happened earlier this week. But Dave, this is a young Dave Kranzler there. You look sharp, buddy. (laughs) All right, we'll take down young Dave Kranzler and replace that. I figured out why Powell, you know, you said you didn't understand how he came to that conclusion. But I got an anonymous tip, I don't know if it's accurate, that he was sneaking into Ben Bernanke's lectures at Princeton. You know, I'm like, wow, I want to be like Ben, who said subprime is contained and other uh, Keynesian economic ideology that might, I don't know. I don't think that Jerome Powell really believes any of the stuff that he says there, but we'll leave that aside. Dave, did you Leave our up? options open. Yeah. And even better than him, did you sign up to win the this month's Arcadia 10-ounce silver bullet giveaway? No, but I'm going to right after this, right after we're done here. It's 10 fine ounces. Keep it out of the I'd bank. I'd still rather have the first Majestic Cube. Well, you got you to gotta start answering the questions. Maybe next year will be your, your time. <laughs> I got one final question for you. Where can people go to figure out how this is all going to play out in the gold and silver markets? (laughs) 
go to church on oh, Sunday. Oh, I stumped him again. You could go to investment research. Go, go to church or synagogue this weekend and pray. Or I'm wondering if there is a mining stock journal by a guy named Dave Kranzler that backs up the truck. Dude, why don't you just send your truck over to the COMEX? This thing will be done by Monday. Come on, buddy. <laughs> well, that one, I guess, was visiting the U.S. men. But If you had taken your truck to the COMEX this week before my weekly options expired, we could have been doing this from the beach already, Dave. <laughs> well, you know what? What I will say now that you mentioned the COMEX and physical, no. physical gold and silver, if the, if the Wall Street bets crowd wants to really squeeze the silver market. You're not going to do it by getting long COMEX contracts because the banks will just print more and sell you all you want to buy. Okay. What you got to do is you got to buy and just, you can even do it with one contract, a thousand ounces of silver. Well, one contract, a big contract of silver is 5,000 ounces. So, you know, form LLCs with your buddies and buy a contract of silver and stand for delivery and then tell the COMEX that you want to take delivery of the bars and move them out of the COMEX. And that's, so that would be five bars. So you get five buddies together, form an LLC, fund it, buy a COMEX contract, stand for delivery, yeah. and, and, and then remove the bars from the COMEX. That's the way the COMEX is going to get squeezed. Not, not in the paper side of the COMEX, but by people, entities who stand for delivery, stoppers they're called technically, and rather than leaving the bars in the COMEX vaults, take them out. We did that in, 2000, I think it was 2009, April. It was April, April contract maybe, I forget. But uh, it, it took us six weeks beyond when we were supposed to have the bars delivered to get our silver out of the COMEX and into the depository where we keep our silver, six weeks. And if we had a bigger fund at the time, we probably would have filed a lawsuit against HSBC because HSBC was the counter counterparty just to bust their stones. We didn't want to waste the, the fund's money on that at the time. Well, I, I that, that's now we got the good stuff. That's what I was trying to get an hour ago. But yes, so kids at home. Well, that's what I mean. That, that's the way the COMEX is going to get squeezed. If, 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 if stoppers remove their bars from the COMEX. And not coincidentally, the COMEX incentivizes people who take delivery to leave their bars in the COMEX because it, there's, there's fees that you have to pay to load out your bars. And the, the fees that they charge to keep the bars in COMEX vaults is much lower. The, the fees are much lower than it would cost to keep the bar. And we're talking like, you know, half a percent. So it's not like you're going to go broke storing your bars. And in in, I personally would, you know, store all my personal silver and gold on my own premise. And that's what I would recommend that everyone does. But if, if you know, you form this LLC and you take delivery of the, of the COMEX silver bars and you move them to another vault, you know, Delaware is not, Delaware and, and, and Can West I send Point some aren't the only silver? places that have precious metals vaults. Can I send some of my silver to be stored on your premise? <laughs> You'll never get it back, but I'll be happy to return fiat. <laughs> what if I just keep hopping the fence I'll, and show I'll, it up I'll in your hot tub? Buy some Bitcoin and trade you the Bitcoin for the silver. How's that? That sounds good, buddy. So <laughs> anyway, folks watching at home, uh, where's the darn webs? There we go. Investment research dynamics. You can get the mining stock journal. Back up the truck like Dave. And uh, perhaps uh, if anyone has been active in the Wall Street uh, bets forum, perhaps someone could put a timestamp of that last section, Dave, where you explain not legal financial advice, but if any kids at home are toying around with a couple billion dollars and want to know how it's done, um, maybe you can even do a write up in the mining stock journal how to short squeeze the COMEX. That could be a hot little seller, right? Maybe I'll do that. Oh, so you don't know, but you got to subscribe to find out, right? That's right. Yeah, that's, that is right. Dave, final question for you. What has Trump been doing? The last I think we've heard from him was <laughs> Tuesday before he left the White House. Where has he been in the last week? I don't know. I didn't he, didn't I 
hear that he bought a small island somewhere in the Caribbean or something? I didn't hear I about no that. I have no idea. Maybe he's in Mar-a-Lago holed up in his bedroom, you know, trying to get back on Twitter, eating Big Macs or whatever. Oh, he doesn't he like the double Whopper with cheese or something? Whatever the McDonald's thing is he likes. You know, it's just getting more fat and grotesque. I don't know about that. Although, did you see that CNBC article that I don't know how I missed this. Apparently, he called the Federal Reserve officials boneheads at one point. <laughs> <laughs> I thought was I'm going to miss that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dave, I thank you for being here. Um, great call as always. Thanks for telling people how they can put some pressure on the short squeeze again if they do so at their own risk and it's something they want and uh, not legal financial advice. And just in closing, what I might be wondering this weekend is that if Trump talked for four months nonstop about the election being rigged, he's shown the term backing down does not appear to be in his arsenal. He's just gone. <laughs>